to mind is that all our fruit is for export and us South Africans get the B or C grade of fruits. So I'm glad that we have quite an expert like yourself just to maybe teach us about trade and marketing around fruits and get an in-depth understanding of what Hort Grow does. So maybe that's just my first question for this evening. If you could just maybe explain Hort Grow as an organization, you know, uh, what is it about and what is it, what is its objective? Um, yeah, Hort Grow is uh, the grow association for, for deciduous fruit growers. Um, we are funded by growers um, through a statutory levy that's in place for four years. And after every four years, we, we do a vote again. And if there's a, a majority vote uh, amongst the, the deciduous fruit growers, then the levy is instated again for a further four years. So, so governed by go- growers, funded by growers. And um, basically two main functions that we, we look after. Uh, the one side is Ortgro Science, which focuses on, on research and development. And then tech transfer, uh, which, of course, has a lot of legs underneath that. And then the other part is the trade and the markets that, um, that I'm responsible for. So looking after market access, market development, um, product standards, regulations, basically logistics these days as well uh, with, with the issues we have in the port. Um, so pretty much anything and any, everything that's got to do with, with markets. Um, right. just, just to add, so we, we don't trade ourselves. Um, okay. So our main goal is to try and create an enabling environment uh, for our growers, exporters, and, and packers to, to flourish in. Right. So we'll get more into detail on that just in a sec. But for people who just don't understand the difference between an ordinary fruit and a deciduous fruit, just what are dis- deciduous fruits? And I don't know if I'm s- pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> your, your pronunciation is correct. Um, so okay. deciduous fruit, the, the technical uh, interpretation or term means fruit that leaves or trees that loses their leaves in, in winter um, mm-hmm. compared to citrus trees, who, which keeps their leaves uh, throughout the year. So, so that's the broad term deciduous. Um, and within our definition of deciduous, um, it refers to foam fruit, which is apples and pears. Um, mm-hmm. In the UK, they call it top fruit. Um, and then the other big group, uh, or smaller group, but the other grouping is stone fruit, um, which is uh, apricots, peaches, nectarines, um, plums, and then cherries. So the ones with a rock hard center or the stone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that Hort Grow came about within four years ago, uh, or maybe you were in the organization four years ago, but it's a member-based organization. What was the landscape like before Hort Grow? So farmers that are farming apples, pears, um, you know, all the, 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 the crops that you mentioned just now, did they have to find their own markets? Um, and is that what brought about the formation of Hort Grow? Um, Hort Grow has actually been around since um, effectively 97, 98. So um, the four-year cycle is basically, we, we've, we, we tell ourselves we've got a four-year lifespan. And if we don't do our job, then the growers won't vote again for, for us and our <laughs> delivery to stay in place. So that's, that's where the four years, four years come in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but prior to 97, um, our industry, as many others, were regulated. So there was only one export in the country. All growers had to export through that, that one export. Then in 97, uh, the industry deregulated, and you could basically pack and export through anybody you want to. So Wood Crow, in essence, came about just after deregulation and um, grew a lot in between and evolved as the times and the, the conditions evolved um, to where we are now. All right. So just also to understand the structure, like you mentioned, it's a grower-led organization. So the farmers pay a certain fee yearly and they employ uh, uh, experts like yourselves, uh, you know, that would work in the office, so to say, to to work on behalf of the farmer's produce while the farmers at the end of the day are still at their farms, et cetera. And then you just, um, you know, working for the farmers, providing the markets, any, um, I think, doc- documentation that's required for trade, logistics, like you said. Um, and then, yes, that is a four-year cycle. Is, is, is that what you say? Yes. So, yeah, the four-year cycle that we, we vote on uh, or the growers vote on. 
So um, it's, it's interesting. Um, our industry is very integrated. So you will find that um, growers or, or groups of growers own a pack house, like the old cooperative type of setup. Um, then this pack house will also do the marketing for them locally as well as abroad. Um, so where we come in is at a higher level where, where these groups of growers um, issues that they can't resolve themselves. And for instance, research that will benefit the whole industry. Uh, we do it on behalf of, of all the growers and, and government relations, we talk market access. Um, it's, it's, it's a level that, that a grower or a couple of growers can't do on their own when you want to get access for a new product to a country like China, for instance. Okay. Okay, great. So let's talk about your specific portfolio. You said you're involved in the trade and marketing side. What does that entail? We well, the one part is um, market development, where we do we don't like to use the word promotions because that's got a, a, a negative connotation at grower level and a, a cheap price. Um, yeah. But we 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 promote um, South Africa as a brand and South Africa as a supplier of fruits worldwide. So we've got market development campaigns running in the UK, in Germany, in the Middle East, Dubai, um, in China. We launched one this year in India as well, um, and also locally. Um, and in the overseas campaigns, it's about dis distinguishing South Africa as the preferred supplier, basically from the Southern Hemisphere. Mm. Um, we supply mainly to the Northern Hemisphere when it's um, opposite seasons. Um, so our main competition is from Chile, Argentina, uh, Brazil, uh, New Zealand, and, and Australia. So internationally, it's, it's creating that platform and that brand, that preferred preference for South African fruit as the preferred supplier. And then on the local market, um, it's just about promoting consumption of, of, of our fruits and stone fruit specifically. Yeah, and without talking too negative around the growers that you represent, is it true that, uh, you know, with, with very uh, niche crops like the deciduous fruits that you've mentioned, stone fruits, is it true that, you know, farmers um, uh, would put first preference to selling the A grade to international markets and then the local South Africans will consume the B grade? It's not entirely true. Um, we, we, we produce too much fruit for the local market, so we have to export. Yeah. Um, otherwise, the local market will be completely oversupplied. And to be brutally honest, your best, best prices is achieved on the export market. Mm. But the fruit that you consume on the local market comes from exactly the same tree. It's mm. treated exactly the same as the export fruit. And in 99% of the, the, the instances, it's about the color of the fruit, or the size of the fruit, or if it's got a little rub mark where it rubs against a, 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 a branch or another fruit. Um, so, so that's basically what the difference is between export fruit and, and local fruit. Um, mm. In many instances, the, the problems comes in after the fruit has been picked and packed and delivered and how it is treated from the packhouse to the final consumer. Mm. Um, once fruit is picked, it has to be cooled and kept in the cold chain up till basically you and I eat it. Otherwise, mm. from the, it, it just uh, degenerates in terms of, of quality. So mm. our, our, what's correct with bugbear is how, how fruit is actually treated by, by the sellers on the local market and, and thrown around and uh, not kept cool and, and so forth. Right. At what point, Jacques, does a farmer then decide that it's time to export? Right, because I could be a, a new fruit farmer, maybe I'm farming pears and I've invested in a huge pear farm um, wherever in South Africa. And at what point do I decide that a certain percentage of my production will go to local market and a certain percentage would go to export? But I want to focus more on the export. So at what point does a farmer decide it's time to export and when do they need to have that decision made? So is it two years in advance? Is it 12 months in advance? Meaning signing those contracts and agreements with your export market um, so that, you know, because I, I can imagine um, with, with, with uh, stone fruits and deciduous fruits, it takes quite some time. And does a farmer need to make the decision to say, with this percentage of crops that I'm going to harvest at the farm, X percentage is going to go to export market. And how does one need to prepare for that? 
Um, I'm going to distinguish a bit. I'm going to leave out uh, the, the dried fruit and the, the fruit that is meant for, for processing and, and canning. Because okay. most of those growers, they, they focus on that. And that's their, yeah, that's their, their focus. But if you talk for, for the fresh market, um, your question is when, when you start making those decisions, that's mm-hmm. probably five years before you even plant the orchard. Um, <laughs> wow. um, I mean, it takes you, if you decide today, I want to plant apple or pear trees, you have to put your order in for trees today. It will take you probably two years at least to get those trees. Um, then you plant them. Then it takes another three, four years at least until they start bearing any fruit. Um, and then probably another three, four, five years before it's in, in full production. So um, it's, it's a long-term investment. It's a huge investment to, to farm with fruit. Um, it's in excess of 400,000 rand per hectare to establish an apple orchard, for instance, at this stage. Mm. Um, just one, one hectare. Um, uh-huh. So then you have to keep that tree alive. You have to feed it. You have to uh, irrigate it. You have to prune it. You have to train it. Um, and then you start getting your small little harvest in year three, four, maybe. So um, mm. just trying to get to, to the extent of your capital as well as your operating capital that's needed before you start even thinking about breaking even. Yeah. Um, so a tree's in the ground for minimum 25, 30 years. Um, so it's a long-term uh, planning that you have to do. And different markets have different preferences for fruit. Um, mm. For instance, Golden Delicious, which is one of our biggest apple cultivars, we mainly export to Africa. Mm. Um, it's a, a green, green, green apple. If you want to export to, say, Taiwan, then it's mainly Fuji, which is a redder type apple. Um, and coming back to the difference between local and, and, and export fruit, um, the East, if you generalize, they want their red fruit. Um, mm. And South Africans are, are happy to have fruit that just tastes good but doesn't have to be glossy red. Um, yeah. Or if you, if you take Pink Lady, which has got a, um, a, yes. a pink blush on the side, yes. uh, the markets overseas want that pink blush, but uh, exactly the same apple from the same tree, which doesn't have the blush, doesn't get nearly as, as close to that price as, as the pink one. Mm. Wow. Wow. And, and, and with, 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 how we co- with how we compared against the global markets, Jacques, is I just want to find out maybe what are the top fruits um, that are in demand specifically from South Africa to the global audience? And uh, what makes us so unique um, when it comes to growing uh, the specific fruits that Hort Grow uh, looks after? Uh, maybe let's start with that point. Um, it's, yeah. it's our unique climate, um, actually a harsh climate for, for growing fruit in. Um, and also uh, South Africa is a water scarce country. Um, so, so our fruit, we believe, and it has been proven, has, has a better eating quality than many of the other fruits produced in, in other countries with abundance of water and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, getting back to... The different markets, um, it differs substantially between fruit types as well. Um, mm-hmm. If you take it back one step, for instance, we export between 45 to 50% of our total apple production. Um, on apricots, we only export 4%. Um, mm-hmm. On plums, we export 75%. Um, and if you start talking markets all over the world, um, 70, well, let's say 70% of our stone fruit gets exported to the UK and Europe. Um, if you take apples, almost 30% goes to Africa like via ship, Western Africa, Nigeria, Eastern Africa, Kenya on that side. Um, and then the other 30% goes to the east, um, whereas we almost send no stone fruit to the east at this stage. So mm-hmm. each fruit kind unique in terms of preferences, in terms of consumers, um, markets uh, and, and specs. Yeah. You mentioned about the high costs in farming the different fruits. Rather, I mean, 400,000 rand minimum per hectare, you know, and then you obviously need to look at operating costs, et cetera, et cetera, before you break even. And you also mentioned the various um, different fruit specs and varieties that different countries would like to buy from South Africa. Um, do you ever, f- have you found yourself as Hort Grow, as an association, in a position where there's a shortage 
of the right type of fruits based on the global markets. You know, but because maybe let's say um, you know certain farmers have stopped farming, uh, or do you find that you know um, an app, a pink apple farmer has now tr- uh, converted into a pear orchard? Um, but do you ever find yourself in a case, or have you had instances where there's been a shortage of a specific fruit spec or variety simply because there was not enough production? Um, not really. Um... I mean, it's supply and demand. So, so the less fruit we have, um, technically, the higher the price should be. Um, but we operate in a global market. So if South Africa's got a drought or issues with production, then the buyers will go to Chile or Argentina or Brazil or wherever they can get the fruit. So it's a, it's a very fluid, integrated, global supply and demand system. Um, mm. Some years our fruit are a bit smaller, so then you struggle to supply the markets who prefer bigger fruit. Um, Mm. Other years you've got some sunburn if there's heat waves Mm. and then you have issues perfect and you you struggle to supply certain markets. Um, But yeah, it's a a very fluid and, and integrated system. Yeah, yeah. So again, with your portfolio, it's all about trade, uh, trade and markets as well. Um, And you know, when you talk about export markets, everybody talks about exporting in a positive way to say yes, export definitely because you get the highest price, you know, you get your crop to be eaten by someone in London or in China or whatever the case is, you know, which could bring a very good story for your farm. But what are some of the downsides of exporting that people are not really aware of? Is it long-term payments, the documentation? I mean, we've heard of the uh, African Free Trade Agreement. Has that really opened up the industry more? So maybe just give us some uh, some idea in terms of the, the, the cons or the downsides of exporting and, and, and what, what people don't usually think of. It is a it's a, it's a high risk business. Um, as I said earlier, it's it's where you earn the most money. So you want to pack as many fruit for the export market as, as possible. Um, the downside is all the accreditations and all the the minimum specs and use of chemicals and uh, all of that that you have to adhere to. So it's I mean it's like a, a book of of rules and regulations that you have have to adhere to in order to export. Yeah. Um, then you have to get the right fruit type and spec and cultivar to supply those markets. And when you get back to the payments, um, the growers are, are always um, the exposed ones. Um, it's not like a, an exporter or a retailer in the UK buys the fruit and takes it from you from your farm or your packhouse. Okay. You ship it to them, they sell it, and if there's any quality issues, all those claims come back, comes back to you. So, um, and it takes you these days 16, 18 days per, 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 per vessel or with shipping to, to get the fruit from Cape Town, say, to, to Europe. Um, and there's a lot of risks involved in that, in, in getting the fruit in the correct quality to those markets. If there's anything wrong, the client, um, and then those claims will come back to you. So you find instances where growers actually have to pay in money to get the fruit destroyed on that side or sold at a low, lower price than production costs, although you've covered the shipping, the packing, the production, all of that. Yeah. And where does Hort Grow come into this part? Because you mentioned that you don't necessarily trade the fruits, you know, but it's more of legislation, documentation, liaison with government, stakeholders, etc. And in these cases, like, where does Hort Grow come in and can you influence the decisions uh, with the global markets by any chance? Um, not at the commercial level. Uh, that's a discussion between the, the customer on that side and the producer and the exporter on, on this side. Um, but on a higher level, we come, come in with a minimum specifications. Um, so there's minimum export uh, specifications for color, for size, for the pressure of the fruit, for the sugar content of the fruits, um, all of that. Uh, that's where we we come in, but that's that's a minimum. You 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 don't aim for the minimum. You aim for for the for the highest spec so you can earn better money. Mm. Established in ninety seven, how big is your membership base right now? Um, you know, and uh, we, we 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 focus a lot on farmers. Are some nurseries uh, and uh, yeah, are some nurseries and maybe some 
some marketers part of Hort Grow because you add, want to obviously add some diversity into the members that you represent? Yeah, we, we are grow focused. So um, all growers of stone and palm fruit are members of, of Hort Grow. Um, we've got about 630 apple and pear growers and about 860 stone fruit growers. Mm. Um, but because we are also integrated, um, although the, the grower is our focus um, and basically the, the, the guy who funds us, mm. um, we, we, we look after them, but also work closely with the pack houses and also work closely with the exporters um, because it's an it's a integrated chain that, that we operate in. So mm. all of that we do... Um, in order for the grower to do the best as possible on, on the farm. Mm. And also just to understand the structure of what grow, uh, Jacques, is, so for example, if I had to decide to invest in a pear farm tomorrow, do I have to be part of Hort Grow? Because, you know, when I heard you talk, uh, it's that, yes, this is a very niche fruit uh, or a niche commodity. And um, as a new farmer, do I have to be part of Hort Grow so that, I don't flood the market with, with a lot of fruits. Um, so, yeah, can one just operate on their, on their own or is it very beneficial to be part of Hort Growth so that you guys can keep control of the amount of fruit that is produced in South Africa and just to get stats like this so that we can compare where, or how, yeah, where we stand with the global markets and to also ensure that you know, new farmers just don't flood the market with a specific fruit and maybe are buying the wrong varieties. How does it work? Yeah, so, so, so we don't control at all. Um, yeah. You can plant whatever you want to, as many as you want to. Um, we don't control okay. the plantings or, or the volumes at all. Um, we, we supply information and we try and inform and, and, and educate people in the right way. Um, yes. But because it's a, it's a statutory measure that's in place, um, as I said, for the four years, um, if there's a majority yes vote, then it's um, uh, gazetted by, by the Minister of, of Agriculture. And mm -hmm. on every carton that's exported or sold, there's an X amount of cents per kilo that, that comes to us. So we've got uh, boards on the palm fruit side and on the stone fruit side that's uh, made up of, of growers. So, mm -hmm. so they govern our functions and, and what we do with their money in, in, in essence. But yeah. not commercially involved, no controls. That was that was. 97, pre-97. Oh, okay, okay. Because I thought maybe, you know, it would be beneficial um, to just keep control or um, keep informed of what new growers uh, are doing on the ground and also not to just flood the market. So that's quite interesting to hear. What we try and do is we, we do a tree census every year. So we know which trees, which cultivars were planted in which areas. And then we can, we've got a model that predicts how much plums will be produced in the next five years or 10 years. So yes. we, can, we can guide the growers and tell them, look at the stats. That's, those are the facts. Mm. We foresee an, hypothetically an oversupply of plums in the next three years. Mm -hmm. So be careful of what you plant. Uh, think about which markets you want to service um, and mm. just be aware of, of what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And another reason why I was asking this is also maybe just to have control of the different maybe disease outbreaks that could happen because this is a huge investment. So I'm sure you wouldn't want any just brand new farmer maybe getting seeds from who knows where, uh, trees, sorry, trees from who knows where, um, or, you know, unknown nurseries just setting up shop. And then all of a sudden there's an outbreak of some funny virus going around and, you know, um, damaging quite a lot of investments that farmers have put on the ground. Yeah, hundred percent correct. I mean, it's a, as I said, a twenty-five year plus investment. Yes. And yes. if you look at the amount of money that you invest over those twenty-five years, um, there's no. Don't take shortcuts when it comes to buying trees. Buy the mm -hmm. proper trees. Buy the right cultivar that's suited to your area. Otherwise, mm -hmm. if you make that mistake in year one, and after three, four, five years, you find out. I made a mistake. You've mm. lost those four years and you have to start over again. And you pretty much, it's, I've, we've done the calculation. I think it's, it's over a million rand that you lose if you planted the incorrect cultivar or the wrong tree quality um, at the start. And you have to, to do it over again. Wow. Jacques, this sounds so fascinating. And I wish I had like an hour of your time because, um, you know, there's just so much 
uh, technicalities and specific things that go into the trade and marketing of uh, the different fruits that Hort Grower represents. But just to sum up our conversation this evening, which has been so fantastic, I just want to find out what are some of the milestones that Hort Grow has been able to achieve, uh, maybe since uh, uh, its, its establishment or maybe since you've been uh, uh, part of the organization. So what are some of the things that we could celebrate about, you know, any information on growers, um, anything that Hawk Grow maybe has been able to break uh, uh, into the market, maybe, you know, um, get on new, uh, what's this, create new untapped territories that, um, you know, some countries that never bought from us before. And now, you know, you've been able to unlock those relationships. So maybe just tell us some of the success stories or milestones that Hort Grow is most importantly part of since maybe its inception or since you have been part of the organization. I think in, in, in general, um, getting, getting those two industries organized and structured and mm-hmm. um, well equipped with information and, and excellent research uh, faci- or infrastructure and, and uh, uh, networks that, that's been built up with the various universities locally as well as abroad and, and the government, of course, and the, the ARC. Um, in terms of market access, um, the, one of the big ones, well, that's already five, six years ago, was getting access to China for apples. Mm. Um, but that process took us 12 years. Um, we applied in 2003 for all stone fruit and all palm fruit the process to kick it off to get access. So yeah. a- Apples was passed in 2015. And I really hope that we can get access for pears before the end of the, of the year. Yeah. Um, but if you look, look globally, um, uh, protectionism and it was just exacerbated by, by COVID, um, protectionism globally, um, com- countries looking after their own interests, after their own growers. Mm. Um, so market access retention has, has become more difficult. Um, Spain wants us out as long as possible with our stone fruit because we compete at the beginning or at the end of their season on their local market. Um, and this is a global phenomenon. So retention of markets, um, gaining of new market access, and then optimizing the, the markets that we do have access to is basically the, the grow um, uh, strategy that we are working with at, on the market access side. Right. Thank you so much, Jacques, for your time this evening. It was very, very engaging and very, very informative. Um, and I think I learned a few things, you know, stone fruit, deciduous fruit, um, the trade thereof. Um, and it's definitely created a lot more anxiety uh, to me around exporting. You know, I'm glad I'm a vegetable farmer <laughs> because then I don't have to deal with so many years of uncertainty, you know, even if you've had contracts in place, but anything could happen, you know. Um, look at what COVID has taught us. Now you're saying that countries have are trying to kick um, certain international markets out and focus on their own farmers. And I can just imagine when you have to relay that information back to the growers to say, maybe we can't go into Spain anymore because, you know, uh, they're deciding to subsidize and support their own farmers. So what do we do at that time? And especially once you've made so much investment and being a farmer in South Africa, I know that farming doesn't come cheap these days. So yeah, it's been such a, 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 an educational and informative conversation and hope we could have you on the podcast once again. It's a pleasure, yeah, you're welcome. Thank Just you. Surround yourself with the, with the right people and right advice and then you can <laughs> get to the export market. <laughs> Absolutely. I definitely agree to that. Thank you so much, Jacques. That was Jacques Dupria, who's the General Manager of Trade and Markets at Hort Grow, which is an association led by growers, deciduous and stone fruit growers. Um, and he told us about, you know, the structure, um, how, how his portfolio works, uh, touched on a bit of the export markets, the trade, the various uh, fruits, um, that are traded in various countries. We spoke about the different specs, the varieties, and some of the technicalities and challenges around trading and exporting fruits. If you've missed this conversation this evening, you could catch us directly onto our YouTube channel, Private Property, under the Farming Podcast playlist, and you could hear everything that Jacques had to say. Um, if you are a fruit farmer, 
please contact Hold Grow if you uh, if that's if you haven't been a member as yet. But if you are a free farmer looking to get more information, please reach out to Jacques, contact uh, Hold Grow, and I'm sure they'll be able to give you sufficient information regarding the trees of different varieties, what you should plant in your area. It sounds like a definite long term investment with huge rewards. Uh, but thankfully, we have organizations like Hold Grow to assist the grower at the end of the day in a lot of the things that, um, you know, uh, are based outside the farm and has to do a lot on the trading, how you position yourself, how, who to market and how you market, etc. Thank you so much for joining the Farming Podcast this evening. Catch me once again on Thursday at 8 p.m. And I will see you then. Take care.